to our workshop, Inclusion at the San Jose Public Library. My name is Lisa Giannotti. I work in the Early Education Department at the San Jose Public Library. Um, I am Rebecca Gonzalez, and I am a librarian at a branch library. And we're very excited to do this workshop today. We work very closely with the Inclusion Collaborative. We've been working with them for years. And um, inclusion is really uh, something that's really important to us at the San Jose Public Library. And I think within the last um, several years, we've really worked on um, what we can do and what, how we can incorporate um, in our programming at San Jose Public Library um, to be very inclusive. And so we're going to talk about some of the things that we've done today, some of the things that we're doing, and some projects that um, possibly are coming up. So again, thank you very much for coming. I'm going to use my clicker. All right. <laughs> um, so just to, is this working? Because it doesn't sound like it to me. OK, wonderful. Um, we want to, again, just talk to you about how inclusion works at the San Jose Public Library, um, talk a little bit about our collection. Um, Rebecca's going to talk to you guys about community conversations, which has been a really big thing and an important um, aspect of what we're doing in the last several years, right? Two or three years at least. So we'll tell you a little bit about that. And um, hopefully you'll gain some information. And, and we're hoping you guys have a lot of questions and can ask us what we do. We brought some hands-on materials. And I'm hoping that you guys might want to come up and um, look at those also. So that's kind of a little bit about what we're doing today. Um, our mission, which I think inclusion goes along really well, is that we enrich lives by fostering lifelong learning and by ensuring that every member of the community has access to our ideas and information. So just by looking at our vision, I think that um, looking at inclusion fits really well with it. And that's why it was something that was really important to us and why we looked at our collection as well as our programming and said, you know, how can we do this? How can we really ensure that every member of the community has access um, to our programs and to our information. So we, again, I told you we work really closely with the Inclusion Collaborative. They've been wonderful in different grants that we've been working on. They have done lots of trainings for our staff and our librarians at San Jose Public Library, um, talking to us about, of course, looking at the whole person, um, not looking at the disability, kind of the whole people first, person first. And they've provided wonderful trainings for us. And I know that that will continue on um, as we move forward with just how we can better incorporate inclusion at the San Jose Public Library. So I work in the early education department. And um, early education, the city has a, a very specific early education strategy. They have a specific idea of where they want early education to go. We're actually looking at standards um, for the city of San Jose in terms of the different programs that we do, whether they be story times or whether they're preschool programs, that there are standards that you can know if you go to one branch and have a story time, that those same standards are going to be at another branch at another story time. So that's a big thing that we've been working on this year. Um, the early education department really looks at and works with families, with young kids, zero to five. That's kind of the focus. But of course, that includes um, older kids, too. There's siblings and families. We know that. And we want to make sure that, um, again, all children receive that strong start so they can be successful. They can be successful in school. That's really our goal, is that every child has access to um, all the great things that early education can give them and be you know, prepared for school. So inclusive story time is one aspect that we looked at. Um, and Rebecca, you can probably fill in a little bit more here. But I know we used to have uh, many um, uh, branches doing story time. San Jose Public Library right now, we have 25 locations, so 25 branches. And I can't, I can't say that there was an inclusive story time at every one of those branches, but we kind of stopped um, that 
several years ago and said, you know what, I think we want to be really intentional with our inclusive story times, and we want to make sure that we're doing them right. And I think that's um, how the Inclusion Collaborative got called in with us, is we wanted them to look at our inclusive story times and say, are we doing this? Are we doing this right? What do you think? Can you give us some ideas? Can you give us some pointers that we should be doing? So I want to say right now there's six branches. Is, is that about right? Six branches that are doing inclusive story time. So it's not at all of our 25. But we wanted to make sure that it was done correctly. We wanted to make sure that it was done respectfully. And, and um, we're starting out small. Maybe it'll grow to another, you know, 20. We don't know. But right now, inclusive story time is at six different branches. So inclusive story time um, is really, it's a story time. It may be a little bit different than our, um, let's say, our preschool story times, our toddler story times. It might be a little bit slower paced. The volume may not be as loud. And usually it's a little bit shorter. Story times can be 20, 25, 30 minutes um, typically. This one may be 15 to 20 minutes for an inclusive story time. Again, we're going to kind of read our audience and kind of see how it's going. Um, but it's for everybody. This is not just a story time for um, children and families that might have a disability. This is a story time for anybody that wants to come, maybe have a little bit of a slower pace. There's not so much loudness going on. So that's kind of how we look at inclusive story time. Do you want to add? You can add. Yeah, something. absolutely. So um, this is where we really bring in adaptations. And again, we've worked really closely with the Inclusion Collaborative to make this happen. So we will use story time schedules. Um, I know a lot of children find a lot of comfort in having schedules. So this would be an example of a schedule right along the top here. We would have a song, song, finger play, book, et cetera. And as we complete each task, we take it off the Velcro. Most of us have Velcro up on top of our felt boards. And we try to be very visual, use a lot of felts, a lot of finger plays. Um, and with the music, you know, depending on who's in the audience, we may decide to go a cappella. We may decide to use our stereo system or adjust the volume. It's really about reading the audience and knowing what's making kids comfortable. We're also very aware that sitting for a long time can be very difficult. Um, we might give them, you know, square spaces or cushions that they can sit in to kind of designate their space. But we recognize that kids will oftentimes need to get up and walk around. And this isn't just specific to kids that would attend inclusive story time. This is a pretty much uh, applies to all children. So if they need to step away, we make it very clear to the parents that it's OK. We don't take offense if you know your child is having a hard time sitting still and just needs to step away. So this is something that I very commonly see, especially when there are children in our story times that may be on the autism spectrum. Um, sitting can be very difficult. Certain aspects of the story time might be difficult for them. And if they would like to step away for part or all of the story time, we don't take offense, and that's perfectly OK. And I think it's important to create a safe space where parents recognize that it is OK. So that's really what our inclusive story times are about. And they're not designed to be separate story times. They're not just story times for children with disabilities, um, because we find that a lot of children benefit from these additional adaptations that we have added, the, the large books that we use, the icons, the schedules. A lot of kids really enjoy this. So this isn't just to segregate. We are trying to make an environment you know, where they can play, and they can interact, and they can socialize with other children. Um, and we've even found that because it's so successful, we've kind of started incorporating elements of our inclusive story times just into our regular story times. So we do a lot of staff training, and a lot of staff members attend. And they may not necessarily want to have a full you know, inclusive story time at their location, but they're like, ooh, I really like the way you use that scheduler. I really like those big adapted books. So they may start incorporating those elements into their regular story times. Any questions? Feel free to raise your hands if you have questions. I think a good point that Rebecca mentioned, I'm just going to mention again, um, again, a lot of these things are good for any of our story times. All of our story times, if kids want to get up, go back, it's perfectly fine. It's not, you know, you have to sit there, um, don't move. It's perfectly fine. So uh, I think a lot of these can carry over to um, all kids. Yes? It's okay. Uh, you know what? Um, 
that's a great question. I can get those to you. I didn't even bring any bound magazines. They're also online. <laughs> we have sjpl.org forward slash events. And if you put in inclusive, it will pull up all the inclusive story times that are scheduled on our calendar. Oh, apologies. <laughs> someone, someone asked um, if we have a list of the uh, branches that are doing inclusive story times. And we were saying you could go to sjpl.org slash events and you can type in inclusive and it will bring up, um, I want to say six, I hope that's correct, and it'll tell you not only where they are, but what times they are. Good question. So again, the benefits of um, inclusive story time, we kind of touched on a few of these, but um, just the whole social interaction and the friendships that can come with just everyone there, um, that it's not restricted to you know just a certain group of kids. This is really, really crucial. Um, I think it's wonderful to have role models uh, for kids to see other children who might be different than them. I think that's a wonderful uh, thing to see. Um, I think that um, there's opportunities for interactions, parent participation. We always ask for parent participation parent participation in all of our story times. Um, but I think um, a lot of parents really want to get in and, and work with their children and, and help them. And um, I think that sometimes it's nice for families to get together. Sometimes it's a real nice family social interaction to be able to talk with other families that might be there and um, talk about their situations and, and their children. So there's a lot of benefits to having inclusive um, story time and just uh, actually, you know, having any uh, families and kids come to the story time. And I want to stress the importance of families feeling more integrated into the community. Something that we hear a lot from parents that have children with special needs after a story time like this is like, wow, this is really great. I was kind of nervous to bring my child. I've tried bringing them to other story times and programs, and we just ended up leaving because of, you know, some maybe behaviors that my child's exhibiting. You know, the other parents were looking at me, and I just, you know, I thought it would be better just to remove my child from the situation. So this is really about creating a safe place where parents feel like they can bring their child, and it's not a big deal if their child starts exhibiting behaviors or has a meltdown. It's just accepted as part of the process. <laughs> More benefits of inclusive story time. Um, again, the friendships, um, mastering activities, you know, pra whether it's practicing the finger plays that we have or just the rhyming, those are wonderful things to practice. Um, that all students' needs are met um, with our, um, again, it's up to the staff member, the librarian that's doing the story time. Um, you know, how many songs that we do, and we have the icons up there, and we do follow that. Um, but they kind of know their audience, so um, that's a, a wonderful thing to have. Respect for all people. Again, um, just having all sorts of different people in a story time. That's a w great thing for kids to see. Um, oh, there's, you know, people that are different than me, families that are different than my family. Um, and... Um, the understanding and accepting of diversity, I think that's a really big thing with children and families. And again, um, to have uh, a story time that's open for all families, for all children, is, is a wonderful way to just talk about, yeah, lots of people are different, families are different, and we're here at a story time. Want to add anything? So again, a little bit more specifics. Rebecca mentioned the icons are there to the left. Um, and we make, did we make those up um, as far as, I don't know who did them, but we gave those out or give those out to the centers, the branches that are doing story times, right? We made the cards? Yeah, I think some of them were linked to us by the Inclusion Collaborative and then some, some things we've customized okay. ourselves. Okay, okay. So basically, um, we, uh, the, s the branches that are doing inclusive story time all have the icons, um, the adaptive, the big books, that was something I know that uh, working with the Inclusion Collaborative was very helpful. So we have the big books and they showed us how to adapt um, different things with the big books. Um, picture choice boards, uh, the schedule, again, to know what's coming after we're singing a song and then I know that we're going to do this and then I know that we're going to have a book. We have different, um, 
things for children to sit on or tape on the ground. Again, I think each branch might be a little bit different, whether it's a circle, whether it's a square of carpet, but that's really important for some kids to have something to sit on. Fidget toys is a big thing. Sometimes kids just can't sit there and they gotta squeeze something. They have to pull something. They wanna shake something. So we have fidget toys for those kids that want it. Again, any child can take one of those. Um, alternating the types of activities, again, knowing your audience, but knowing, can I go a little bit louder with this song, or you know, maybe we should just kind of keep it at this level. I think you get to know your families and kids that are there and kind of can, can judge what you're doing with that. Allowing the kids, like we said, at all of our story times. If you need to get up and stand, and it's not a time to stand up, go ahead and stand up, it's fine. If you need to move around, if you want to run to the back, it's totally fine to do that. Possibly dimming lights, if we can do that. Sometimes, you know, our lights are on one major system and that's kind of hard, but sometimes we can dim lights in like the children's area and that's really nice. Sometimes that creates a, a little bit of a calmer atmosphere. And I think um, I get asked a lot is, you know, what do you do for like, you know, when you do songs, when you have kids that may have like uh, mobility issues. And I find that pretty much anyone can participate in any song. It's not limited just because it's asking you to, you know, do something or do a motion. There's ways that people can still participate. For example, we have these really cute little egg shakers that kids love to shake. And um, one of my inclusive story time um, people who comes, um, he is in a wheelchair and he has very limited mobility um, in his hands, but he'll grab that egg shaker and he'll just rattle it and he just, he has a ball with it. So there really is, or, you know, if he's struggling to hold something, you know, his, his aid might help him and help him move his arm with, with whatever, you know, the, the scarf or the bean bag or whatever we're using. So there are fun ways. You just have to be creative in how you adapt. So part of our collection at San Jose Public Library is what we call We Play and Learn Activity Kits. Um, I want to say we have 11 concepts. I meant to count before I came here. These are the two newest ones, and these are um, kits that we, again, worked very closely with the Inclusion Collaborative of what to put in them. So We Play and Learn Activity Kit is treated just like a book in our libraries. You can check it out for three weeks. These are what we call uh, floating. So let's say your home library is Edenvale branch and you go and you want to get, because you heard today from the presentation, oh, this making friends kit sounds really, really cool, and they don't have it there, you can request it. So they'll get it from another branch that has it and you can pick it up at any branch. So I guess what that means is these, these kits could be all over. Um, and they're really, really wonderful. We've had great feedback. It started out, these kits started out years ago just being able to be checked out by um, child care providers. And we have topics like uh, alphabet, dinosaurs, colors, numbers. And then we had feedback from families who saw them and said, well, I want to check that out. How come only child care providers can check that out? That doesn't seem fair. So that's kind of how it um, came into being that now anyone can check them out. So our two latest kits that we, um, we got these out in May, I think, right? We, we um, put these in circulation. One is called Feelings and one is called Making Friends. And, oh, I'm supposed to stand in this box. I'm so sorry. Okay. Um, these were really fun to make. So we actually sat down, Rebecca and myself and the manager of the early education department and the inclusion collaborative had a couple staff. And the kits typically have books they typically have toys in them. And what we do, which um, has been really um, beneficial, what we've heard from families, we have what we call tip sheets. And these tip sheets give you ideas on how to use the toys inside, maybe some extended activities you can do with the books and or the toys. And we have the tip sheets translated into um, Spanish, Chinese, and Vietnamese. So these tip sheets are in each one of our kits. And um, these were just really, really fun to make. And if you'd like to, after we're done, please come up and look at these. So um, they're a little 
heavy. These kits are really designed with looking at families that have children with disabilities. They're a little heavy on books, but the idea was some of these books are a little bit for the caregiver, the, um, the adult that is working with the child, but they had such great information we wanted to put it in. So with the feelings kit, um, for instance, the mirrors in there, you can do tons of activities with this. I think some of the ones on the tip sheet, you know, look in the mirror, uh, can you make a happy face, can you make a sad face? For infants, for little, little ones, just looking in a mirror is fun. They can chew on this. It's, you know, it's um, plexiglass. It's not uh, glass or anything. These are darling. So these, I think they're called, feel, I, I forget the name of this, but there's dolls that have different faces. And they come in this cute little sack. And again, you can talk about, depending on the age of the child, you can talk about, what does the face look like on this doll? Have you ever been sad? Again, you can kind of really tailor it, and that's what the tip sheet talks about, thank you, um, to the age of the child that you're working with. You know, older kids will probably understand. Have you ever had a time when you've been sad? You know, let's talk about that, versus little ones are not gonna probably be able to go that far. There's some cool, just pictures. And it has on the back the feeling so you can just flip through these, talk about, they can learn vocabulary, they can look at pictures, you can talk about scenarios. I think one of the items on the tip sheet is an extension is you can do pictures of your own child or yourself and kind of um, have them at home make your own book. So you can have a, um, a flip book of your child and yourself. So there's some really great activities in this one. So feelings was one of the um, new ones that we did. And making friends is another one. We have puppets in there, we have dolls in there, and it's all about making friends. Uh, the Inclusion Collaborative was wonderful in what books might be good. Um, making a calming jar is one of the things that we have that is uh, one of the things the Inclusion Collaborative said, you have to have the calming jar. That's a really you know, big thing, so we're doing that. And um, again, we gave tips on different conversations you could have with the puppets. You could read the puppets with one of the books, on and on. So these have been pretty popular. Um, we've had some good feedback. Rebecca, you had a family that said she really enjoyed. Was it the puppets that they liked? Yeah, so we had one family. Um, they were actually, I think they had three, two, two or three children in the family, but the mom returned it. She was like, we had so much fun with this kit. Even my older kid was getting into it, like doing the activities with my younger one, like modeling, you know, some of some of the scenarios. Um, because that that's really that's really what we want. Like for making friends, we want we want children to know what makes a good friend. When is someone being a good friend to you? When is maybe someone not being your friend? So these are all very universal concepts that I think a lot of children struggle with in general. And same with feelings. A lot of times children have difficulty recognizing feelings in themselves, recognizing feelings in others, and it also teaches them important, you know, coping and self-regulation skills, which is something that um, is even um, important with really with all kids. So we're finding that these are having very broad appeal. Um, and we, you know, we put a lot of thought and research into what we put in here. We read a lot of reviews. You know, we talked, we, we recognize we're not experts in, you know, in everything, so that's why we reach out you know, to other organizations and professionals, ask for feedback, show them what we're looking at, you know, what types of activities, what do you think of this activity, et cetera. So there really was a lot of intentionality put into each of these, these kits. We ordered some books and toys that we took a look at and said, you know, too many pieces. That's a, that's a big thing when we're looking at these kits. If there's too many little pieces, probably not a great idea. Some of the books, the pictures didn't thrill us, so we were like, uh. Um, so yeah, we really went over these and over these. Yes? You know, um, so a question was asked if someone in another county wanted to uh, make a kit like this, um, is there a list of um, the items in there? There is. Um, on each 
lid, there's a contents list, but even before that, working on making these up, um, yes, I made a list because I wanted to know the cost for each one, and I also put down where to get it, so if other people wanted to buy it, whether I got it on Amazon, whether I had to get it from another entity, so yes. And the question was asked, how can we access um, the list of items that are in these different kits? Um, if you get a hold of me, Lisa Giannotti, at um, the San Jose Public Library, and I can leave my information, um, I can certainly get that to you. Any other questions Any about the questions kits? Any questions about the kits? Okay. One other thing that I really want to highlight um, is we are also currently working on, whoops, social stories for the library, for visiting the library. Um, this one has post-its all over it because it's, it's still kind of going through its editing phases, but this is, this is our soft, uh, soft draft, I guess. Uh, but this one is called, I am going to the library, a social story about visiting the San Jose Public Library. And we um, were very specific about including pictures that featured real people um, because we wanted it to be as realistic as possible for the kids. Um, we have pictures of different library locations. Um, oh, yeah, perfect. So, you know, it talks about, like, what are the expectations going into the library? What are some of the things you might do in the library? Um, how do you check out books? Who can you ask for help? So a lot of those concepts that children may have questions about or anxiety about going into the situation. And these, I believe, will be available for checkout and also available online, I believe. Um, but we're, like I said, we're still working on the drafts. But this is something that we're pretty excited about. And then on the very last page, we actually have information about what a social story is and what it is used for. So you know, maybe people who are new to the concept can have a little bit of more information about those. Does anyone have any questions about this? Yes. Uh, other social stories? Um, I believe we have one that's, well, we're currently also working on that's about story time. I think so. Yeah, I think we're working on one that's also specifically about story time. It's, I think, mentioned in this one, but the story time one will actually go into more detail about what to expect during a story time. And I think the hope and intent is that eventually we can create more social stories for different types of programs and then make them available as PDFs that are accessible to parents at home, either on a device or printable. Okay. You have thoughts on that? Okay. All right, so now we're going to kind of transition to something a little bit different. Um, the evolution of San Jose Public Library's programming for adults and teens with IDD. So I think at this time it's be appropriate to say a little bit more about what got me into this, um, or what got me passionate, I should say, rather, about inclusion. Um, I worked at a branch library, and one day I had a SPED teacher come in, and he asked me, and he said, do you have any programs that you think would work really well for my students. And I said, well, you know, tell me a little bit more about your students. And he's like, well, they're in middle school. They're, um, they're moderate to severe disabilities, so um, they're, low, they're considered low functioning. Um, they're in middle school, but they have the cognition level of preschoolers. And I said, you know, at this location, we don't currently have anything that I feel like matches really well what you're looking for, but I'm certainly open to discussing with you the possibility of creating a program. So we scheduled a meeting, and he told me a little bit about the students, what they liked, what they disliked, what some of their challenges are. And so I created, um, I started an inclusive um, story time at my location, but it was kind of an inclusive story time with a twist because it was actually geared towards older children um, because most of our inclusive story times are geared towards a younger audience. So this one, instead of having a stay and play, it had a craft, and I tried to pick things that were of high interest to middle schoolers. Um, and it went so well, and it quickly became like one of my favorite programs. Um, I started to kind of just learn a little bit more about you know, how to level crafts, what kind of crafts would be of high interest. He would told me specifically what types of skills they were working on in the classroom, so he really liked things that involved fine motor skills and things like that. So I really started to become very passionate about that, and then I thought, well, you know, what is there for adults? So I started looking at what other branch libraries are doing. And there were a few, not a lot, libraries that were offering programs that were geared specifically towards adults with intellectual disabilities. So I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. I want to get on board with that. And they had modeled their programming. Um, Contra Costa County 
has done a really great job. They created a program called Insiders. And the purpose of Insiders was to make people that had previously felt marginalized um, feel included. So instead of being outsiders of the, what the library had to be offer, they became insiders. So again, the purpose is not to segregate people um, by putting them in these specific programs, but these programs do offer more adaptations, and um, they're typically um, things that we have noticed or observed are of high interest, um, or that, you know, for teens and adults with intellectual disabilities. So this has kind of grown, and um, the people who run these programs typically tell me it's their favorite program. They look forward to it. We, most of them run it monthly. And so I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But as we've started to grow, we have been working a lot with the, um, an, a, 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 a member of the State Council for Developmental Disabilities. And she really opened our eyes to, well, it's nothing about us, or nothing about us without us. And that really kind of stuck with us and resonated with us. And we're like, yeah, we should definitely be then asking, what is it you want? So, and that's something that we've kind of been focusing on as a system. And that's where um, community conversations come in. Um, about two years ago, the, um, the San Jose Public Library decided that they wanted to do this on a large scale. They just wanted to start looking outward and finding out not what we think the community wants, but what the community actually wants and needs. So we used um, the model from the Harvard Institute. Um, and again, looking outwards is kind of their, their motto. And so um, the idea of a community conversation is to provide a safe place where people in your community can come together to talk about their aspirations, concerns, and how they want their community to move forward. So really they're kind of um, guided focus groups where we ask very specific questions and then we you know, record the feedback that we receive. Um, so I decided I wanted to do a community conversation with one of my, um, my groups um, that would regularly come in for programming that had intellectual disabilities. So I looked at the questions that we had and um, we had already pared down all the questions into what we called the four ask questions. Um, and these were questions that we would take with us to outreach of Chavinches or more informal settings. And so I looked at those and I took those, those um, asked questions and I kind of revised them. I kept them mostly the same, but I, I changed some so they'd be a little bit more plain language. And I decided that I was gonna do this with my group. Um, I gave everyone name tags, which I later came to find out worked really well because um, unfortunately I don't know the names of every single person who attends my programs because sometimes I get between 30 and 50 people and sometimes they, it, it's different people each month. So I don't, sometimes I have, I have some regulars but then sometimes it's new faces. So I wanted to have the name tag so that I would be able to address people specifically by name. And um, the reason why I bring this up is because I found that there were a lot of people in the group that they had thoughts and they had ideas but they wouldn't share them unless I specifically address them by name. So, you know, John's over here in the corner and he's being very quiet and I ask this question, you know, some people, some people are more vocal and we find this is true of all community conversations. They'd speak up real quick, say their piece, and then there would be a lot of silence. So I said, you know, well, John, what do you think about this? And turns out John has a lot of opinions about what we're talking about. So writing that down. Um, I would recap the discussion questions, so if I found that the, the conversation was starting to veer, as conversations often do, I could kind of redirect by um, either rephrasing the question or just kind of going over what we had just talked about and, you know, kind of saying back what they had said to me and, you know, writing down what they were saying and, like I said, calling on people who weren't contributing and by the end everyone had contributed something to the conversation. So um, I was not the only location to do this. I kind of wrote down my best practices and I sent it out and there were some other locations that also chose to do this. And so they, um, at the end, we as facilitators do a reflective piece where we take um, what people have said and we kind of look at it. We look for common themes and then we create what we call a Mad Lib, which is basically summarizing. Um, what we have learned from this community conversation. So some of the feedback we received, I pulled this from both my community conversation as well as other community conversations that we had throughout the system. Um, there were a lot of concerns about safety. You know, walking alone at night, um, there were some people that had concerns about pedestrian safety, people driving um, erratically because, you know, they're in a wheelchair and it makes them nervous, you know, if someone's pulling up really close to them or they're worried that they're gonna get hit. Um, you know, safety in their neighborhood, you know, 
people that they don't know, you know, loitering outside their buildings, et cetera. Um, so that was something that I documented. Concerns about the environment. There were people that were very concerned about droughts and what that means, you know, having to conserve water. What does it mean when we don't have enough water? You know, why is there trash everywhere? You know, why is it not very green? You know, why is there not a lot of trees or, you know, flowers? Um, other themes that emerge is strong desire to build strong relationships. This came up over and over and over again. People love the opportunity to socialize. They want to make friends. They want to have romantic relationships. They want to have mentors. Um, another thing came up, strong desire for independence. People want to be able to live independently. They don't necessarily want to be living, you know, with their parents. They want to be able to live with friends or, you know, in assisted living facilities. Um, there was also strong interest in work and volunteer opportunities. A lot of them do have been in work programs and they found it very fulfilling and they want to continue that and they want to be, they want to um, have wages so that they can, again, contribute to their own independence. So these were some pretty interesting things that came out of these conversations. So another thing that we did um, was we did an online survey. Again, we did this um, in conjunction with the State Council for Developmental Disabilities. Um, we didn't find that we received as much feedback from these um, online surveys, but we did receive some. I would send these out a lot to you know um, day, uh, pro day program coordinators that we would work with or other people that had attended our events and at some point had given us you know, their contact information. I, so I sent these out and asked if they could elicit feedback on our behalf. And um, some of the feedback that we received from this, because it was most specifically about activities and programming that people would like to see at the library. Um, this is just a snapshot of what we received. I have like a whole page of, of feedback that we received, but origami and painting, making friends, drawings and coloring, music, policemen, bodybuilders, movies. I would like to have a party and snacks, reading program, and much more. So these were all things that we are looking at and taking into account when we're creating programming. Also, outreach events. I found that this was a really great place to talk to people. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges with designing programs is, um, or even eliciting feedback is, um, it's sometimes really hard to get people to come to like a community conversation if it's not already an existing group that visits the library. We don't want to just reach the people that are already library users. We want to reach the people who are not library users because we want to know why aren't they coming to the library? What would it take to make them come to the library and use a lot of our really cool resources and services? Um, so we, a very important piece of this was going to outreach events. So we went, we went to the, in one year I went to the Parent Helping Parents Resource Fair. Um, so this is something that's put on, um, it's a huge event. You, they get like, I would say like between 300 and 500 people that attend this event. It's really great. They bring um, people from all over the Bay Area that offer resources specifically to people who have disabilities. Um, and it's, it's the parents, they come in and they find out about these resources. So. I would bring um, my little post-it notes and I would kind of ask people some questions very similar to the ask questions, you know, and um, I would write down the feedback that I received. Um, I also went to World Disability Day, which is a huge event that we have at City Hall. It seems like it's getting bigger every year, um, it, which is very exciting. So I got a lot of chance, a chance to talk to a lot of people. And I went to the Conclusion Collaborative State Conference last year and they actually, one of the days they had um, organizations tabling. And so this was kind of a cool opportunity for me to elicit feedback from educators, people who work specifically with students that have special needs. Um, and so the people that I received feedback from that I collected were people with disabilities, families of people with disabilities, and caregivers, um, and as well as educators. So I got a really diverse array of opinions and feedback. And so, so examples of some of the feedback I received, um, we need more programming for teens and tweens. We have been, I would say, very good about offering programming to the younger age demographic, but then there's kind of a gap because you've got, you know, our zero to five, eight-ish, and then we've got adults. And there's not a lot for teens. And we found that this was, um, this came up over and over and over again because parents were like, it is so hard for me to find extracurricular activities where my child feels welcome. And um, so social opportunities that focus on fun rather than education. So a lot of these kids, you know, because they have IEPs, because they have a lot of these specific goals, they spend a lot of time in classroom type settings. So sometimes they're just looking for something that's fun. 
Um, they wanted programs that are offered on weekends or late in the afternoon, early evenings. Again, they have a lot of therapies that they have to attend after school, so it can be very difficult to go to an after school program. Um, programs, they want programs that participants can build friendships with their peers. Um, earlier this morning, we had the keynote speaker that had the Best Buddies program, and I just thought that was such a great idea because we're that's something that we're trying to look to start, something similar to that at the library, because having these social opportunities is just so huge. Um, so we're trying to make more opportunities like that. Um, they would like more inclusive programming at library branches that we know are located near county SPED programs. Um, that was some feedback that I re um, received from some educators last year. They're like, well, you know, I work at this school and we're right next to a library, but they don't offer anything like what you're describing. So I said, okay, so maybe we need to do a little research about which branches are actually specifically close to these county, um, county locations. Um, so more opportunities to exercise. There was a very strong interest in sports. That came up over and over again. And then coding programs and reading groups, specifically geared towards people with disabilities. These were also themes that um, reemerged numerous times throughout my conversations. So the big question is, what are we doing with all this information? Um, last year was kind of... Um, it was kind of phase one. So phase one was gathering the information. Again, like I said, we can guess what people want, but maybe that's not necessarily what people want. So we wanted to get the feedback first so that we could design programming around the feedback that, that we were receiving. So one of the things that I am most excited about, we have just purchased an affiliate license and book sets to start next chapter book clubs at select SJPL locations. We have just recently identified which locations want to participate. So we're about to move into the phase where um, we start promoting it and we start um, uh, offering volunteer opportunities for people to act as facilitators, also get interest lists and signups. Um, for those of you who have not heard of Next Chapter Book Club, it is a really, really awesome program. Um, as it says here in the picture, it's helping people with disabilities enjoy books, friends, and their communities. And one of the things that really, really liked about this particular program was it's not necessarily about literacy. It's more about a social opportunity to go to discuss, um, you know, what they're reading with their peers. And What's really cool about it is it does not matter what level of literacy they have because there are mechanisms in place that will assist people, you know, regardless of their reading ability. So it's really cool. Um, actually, what I really liked about it in the promotional video that I initially saw was it said literacy is kind of a happy side effect of this club. Some people have found that their literacy has increased through this type of learning but it's really just more about fun. It's about you know ha going out to a public place, getting out into the community, making friends, having something to look forward to you know, each week. And so um, that was something that got me really excited about it. So that is something that is currently in the works. And this is also in direct response to all the feedback we got about what people wanting to have reading groups for um, people with disabilities. So one of the things we were able to do immediately was we were able to increase offerings of workshops on topics such as voting, personal safety, fire safety, local plants and wildlife for adults with IDD. As you saw, one of the feedback, people wanted police. And they're also concerned about their personal safety. So I was able to organize with our um, the crime, crime prevention department of San Jose. I was able to get them on board to come do a workshop on personal safety. And it was really great because, you know, they had this wonderful PowerPoint. You know, they talked about, you know, different scenarios, what you might do in those personal scenarios, how to recognize if something's getting dangerous, how to interact with police officers, which is something that I thought was really important because it's not always intuitive to everyone what to do if you are approached by a police officer. And unfortunately, a lot of tragedies occur because people react wrong. You know, the person may not recognize that they are potentially someone with a developmental disability. So if they're reaching into their bag or, you know, they're displaying um, behaviors that would otherwise seem suspicious, you know, there's, there's an op um, unfortunately a possibility of somebody getting hurt. So, you know, they talk to them about, you know, what to do, you know, don't reach into your bag, you know, answer their questions, you know, provide ID when asked. Those types of things that I just think are really important 
um, for most people to recognize. Um, something that I'm really proud of was um, organizing a voting workshop. Um, we actually got um, we actually got people from the I think it's the bureau. Yeah, the Census Bureau, they actually came and they brought voting machines to our location. So we had people come, they talked about the importance of voting, why their vote matters, you know, how to research various topics, and then they actually did a live demo with them, hands-on, um, how to um, use a voting machine. So this is not something that everyone knows how to do. So now, because the library is a location where they can cast their votes, if they choose to at, um, exercise their right to vote, they can go to the library and they know how to use the machines and they know how to ask for assistance. Um, we had a lot of people who have a lot of interest in animals. So the plant and wildlife workshop was super interesting, including to me, because I don't know much about our local plants and wildlife. And it was very hands-on, very interactive. It was super great. Um, what we learned from our community conversations is that, you know, not only do people want to work, they also want volunteer opportunities. So um, I started working with um, a couple organizations that could help facilitate that. Um, there's one program that um, they organize volunteer opportunities for adults with developmental disabilities. So um, I had a meeting with them and then we started, we created a schedule, you know, we got their aides fingerprinted because we, to be a volunteer at the library, you do have to be either supervised or have a fingerprinting if you're over the age of 18. So we got all their supervisors fingerprinted and then they bring groups in, they sign in, they do tasks and um, they do a lot of very meaningful work at the library through their volunteerism. Um, another organization that was we were approached by is Achieve Kids. It's not really so much an organization, more of a charter school um, that specifically works with kids um, with differing abilities or special needs. And um, they have this really cool volunteering program that they do through the school. And so, you know, they worked with us to create opportunities for their teens to come to the library and do volunteer tasks. And uh, this has been super great. Uh, just a quick anecdote. I actually went to the Parents Helping Parents Resource Fair earlier this year. And I was talking to one of the parents. And I was like, yeah, you know, here's some of the things we have going on at the library. Here's some things to look forward to. And she's like, she's like oh, she's like, my son actually already volunteers at the library. And I was like, oh, really? And I was like, that's great. She's like, yeah, it's been such a great experience for him. He's really learned a lot, and it's been really great. He's very proud of the work that he does there. And I was like, you know, well, what, what's your son's name? And she told me his name, and I was like, that is one of my volunteers. He comes to my library to volunteer. So I actually have seen your son on a weekly basis, and he is doing great. And um, what I really like about these types of opportunities is it teaches teens important work skills that they can take with them um, as they, they grow older and they decide to enter the workforce. Um, I remember the first time this particular teen came in, he had a very difficult time, so much so that they eventually had to step away and they said, we'll try again next time. So then they came back the next time um, and he was a little, he wasn't quite over, his senses weren't quite so overloaded. So, you know, he, he learned, you know, what the back room was, where to sign in, et cetera. And he, you know, he learned about the tests. Well, eventually he became a pro at those tasks. So then he started wanting more difficult tasks. So then we were kind of able to give you know, him more tasks and he's able to try new things. One of the things that his, um, his teachers wanted him to work on and as well as other teen volunteers is, you know, if you're, if you're gonna enter the workforce, you may be required to wear a uniform. So for your next shift, we're gonna ask that you wear a collared shirt. So because this kid has some sensory challenges, the collared shirt, was a huge hurdle for him. He had a lot of difficulty with it. The first day, he, uh, he had a very difficult time. And again, he had to step away. And um, they're like, we'll try again next time. So it's, it's really creating this environment where it's OK. You can try again next time. We'll try it. We'll do our best. We'll come back. We'll try it again. So it's a safe place for them to try out these skills. Because if he were to just enter the workforce, and he would have this situation happen where he has to wear a uniform shirt, you know, it would be a very different scenario than where, you know, now he's able to try these skills out in a safe environment. So this is something that we are very excited about, and I'm hoping that we can see more opportunities like this throughout the system. 
All right, so we have also been working with our central programming department to get a greater selection of performers and our enrichment options that are geared specifically towards teens and adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, one of the benefits of being in a large library system is that we have a really great central programming uh, unit that does a lot of work for us to make our lives easier. So they send out a quarterly programming menu and it's optional, but we can look at the selections and we can be like, ooh, that looks like a fun craft. So basically what they do is they offer specific um, crafts and programmers, uh, or performers, I should say, um, and we can look at that. And if we choose to offer that at our location, we give them a date and time, then they will give us the supplies or sign up the performer on our behalf. And this is especially great for the, um, the libraries that serve more low income areas. Um, a lot of our funding for programming does come from our Friends of the Library Foundation, but each branch library actually has its own Friends of the Library Foundation um, that is run by volunteers, and it is separate from the library, and it's not, they're not all connected. So what unfortunately ends up happening is the library locations that are located in more affluent areas have very large, very active friends groups who really campaign for them, who really raise a lot of money for their programming, and so they've got buckets of money to support their additional programs, supplies, performers, et cetera. But then you go to the more low-income areas and they have different challenges there. You know, people are working hard to make ends meet. You know, they don't have a lot of extra time that they can just volunteer at the library. Um, or, you know, they're working multiple jobs, they're working late. Um, so we find that those locations tend to not always have an existing friends group, or they may have just one friend who's really overloaded and doesn't have the capacity to offer a lot of book sales and do a lot of events. So what happens then, unfortunately, those locations then don't have a lot of extra money for supplies, programs, and performers. Um, so another thing that this central programming office does for that does for us is they do they take into account those things they look at the branches that um, don't have the extra funding and they have a special pot of money that they then allocate so that we can have performers we can have extra supplies and so that is really a great benefit of having that but and what's really cool about this is we as librarians, we get some input in what's going to be offered on the, the menu, what sort of performers are going to be offered. Um, so we can submit our suggestions in advance. And for example, if they, you know, if the performer can, you know, they can coordinate with them and get all the insurance stuff in place, then they can then offer that on the program. So we look at, we looked at what were some of the high interest requests, what was most commonly asked for, and we we're able to design crafting programs, we're able to pick performers that, um, or, or presenters that meet these needs, and then we can then offer those up to our central programming, and then they'll coordinate all the details for us. So that was another immediate change that we were able to make, being it's done quarterly, we were able to just start immediately um, suggesting programs and services that we thought would be of high interest. Um, does anyone have any questions about that? We're pretty much um, towards the end of what we've prepared for today. Um, we have some extra time, so we will show a video, but uh, yes. Yes, so, um, oh, sorry, yes. So you're asking if we have, um, we have a list of which events are specifically um, geared towards teens and adults with intellectual disabilities. The answer is yes, but it is a little more complicated. Um, right now we are calling it insiders. Like I said, we kind of um, took that idea from Contra Costa County and we sort of ran with it. So we've been kind of labeling things in our catalog, um, our online catalog as insiders events. It also shows up in our SJPL Bound, which is our marketing magazine, as insiders events. We also have a tag, um, but I think we're this next year because we're we're really shifting our focus on inclusion. I've had meetings with our marketing department, and I think next year there's going to be a much bigger push on formalizing our inclusive services to make them more visible, to make it these programs easier to find. So that may change, um, like what we call it or how we're marketing it or how we're tagging it um, in our, our catalog. So I guess just stay tuned. We're hoping to also just get a lot more material pushed um, in terms of marketing um, to make this more findable um, because they're, 
yeah, a logo and everything, you know, to just to, to really um, drive home that we have these services available because um, we find that a lot of people don't realize how much the library has to offer. Um, and we're always looking for new partnerships. So that's why we really like talking to educators because you guys are some of our biggest advocates. Um, in fact, the, um, the special education teacher that I specifically mentioned earlier that kind of got me started on this pathway, um, he's been super great and he, he has been referring other students, or not other students, but other parents and, um, and educators to me. So, you know, she's the one to come ta go talk to if, you know, you wanna do something extra with your students or with your kids um, after school, it's all free, it's great highly recommend so I've had other teachers reach out to me and I've I've gone I've done classroom visits I've had them come visit me I always talk to them to find out you know what are you looking for and I try to you know make special library visits around that um, we really encourage them to bring their kids in for tours um, and it's always really exciting for me when you know maybe the kids that I haven't seen in a long time they come back in and they recognize me. That always just makes me really happy and excited. Um, another thing that I've noticed is um, because we're trying to create this um, this very welcoming um, environment, you know, we want to just make everything accessible. Um, that's you know the ultimate goal. But because there's a lot of fear, you know, around trying something new, I think these inclusive programs just make it a little bit easier for them to just start coming into the library and then you start seeing them coming in for other reasons and they recognize you, they know who you are, so they'll approach you maybe just to chat, maybe to ask questions um, and that's been really great um, because really we wanna integrate them into all of our programming. One of the things um, we wanna do this next year with having maybe putting together an accessibility committee to talk about how can we make all of our programming more accessible, um, you know, if people call in and they need accommodations so that they can participate in a, in a program, then they can do so. Um, so that's something that we're kind of excited to be working on in the next coming couple years. Um, I'm sorry, I think I really... Numbers changing a lot, um, and it, and it's kind of um, it's kind of a false number because I I've even had one location to be like, hey, can you stop advertising us because our group is so big oh. that like now like we don't want we want to kind of wait until if if the size dwindles down then we can start openly marketing that particular program again. But right now it's so big we can barely fit the capacity of the room. <laughs> so um, so yeah so so there's. Um, it depends. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, something that's something we're excited about growing. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So um, generally what we'll do, um, uh, depending on where you're located, we, we pretty much, we serve specifically mostly the San Jose, you know, air service area. Um, but if you have a school and you would like us to come do a visit, we would love that. And we may be able to connect you either um, with the library that's closest to you, the librarian that's closest to you, or we might send somebody, you know, to come and do the programming for you, depending on what you're asking for. We love those kinds of requests. We find it find that it's actually really difficult sometimes to contact educators directly. So we like when they approach us. Um, when I first started my inclusive story time, I was so excited about it and I had such great success with it that I thought, oh, I should just start reaching out to the local county programs and asking teachers, you know, if, if they want class visits, if they want customized programs, you know, and I ran into a lot of walls. <laughs> um, it was really hard, A, to find the contact information and um, B, when I did find it, um, oftentimes I would have still have trouble getting directly to the teacher and the person that I would end up talking to is kind of like, oh, well, that's not something I think our kids can do, so we're not really interested in that. And I'd be like, but I don't think you really understand like what I'm offering, you know? So I wasn't really able to speak to the teachers directly. Um, and so that was kind of a huge, that's kind of, that's been a continuing barrier. So yes, please tell us, reach out to us, tell your friends about us. Mm -hmm. Oh, perfect. What's your closest branch? Do you know? I was just going to reiterate what um, 
Rebecca said in that usually we find the branch that's closest um, and you can check with their staff to say, hey, I'd like to do it. I know I worked at the Tully branch once and four C's came. They had a standing um, play group once a month. So we reserved a room for them and they came and did their thing. Um, so that can also be where you just need a room for something. But, um, oh, nice. Wow, that's great. So you're kind of you're 15 minutes from here. We'll just we'll we'll um, work with you and see if we can figure out what's your closest branch. And then I would say start with them. And like Rebecca said, we're I think you guys are used to people calling up and saying, "Hey, um, can you come do?" Um, and then you guys work out. You know, if it's um, a one-time thing. And I can't speak for people's schedules. I don't know the staff. You know, schedules. But um, I think we do love to do stuff like that. We do. It's fun. <laughs> Absolutely. So she's asking if we can do like outreach, like tabling sort of events for community events. And the answer is absolutely yes. We love to table at events. That is one of the best ways, again, to talk to non-library users because our ultimate goal is to bring everyone into the library and to have everyone have the best experience possible. So that's that would be a perfect opportunity for us to go talk to, to families. Any other questions? Okay, so we do have some time left. Um, we have a, a lot of really great training videos that were made for us by the Inclusion Collaborative, and one of them is specifically about inclusive story times. Um, not all of it will be applicable to you um, because it is, again, a training video for staff, but it does give you kind of a better idea of what inclusive story time is and how the accommodations and adaptations work. So, unless, do you have anything else to add, Lisa, before I, I do don't, that? I don't, no. Okay, wonderful. Okay, Oops. scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Okay. Hi, I'm Ed Cadiz. I'm a librarian with the San Jose Public Library. And what you'll be seeing in a few minutes is a story time, an inclusive story time that we recently did at the Almaden Branch Library. I think what you'll be benefiting and seeing is sort of a, it all in, in context and uh, see some Maybe of the, the theory yeah. put into application. Mm -hmm. So I hope you'll enjoy it and learn some techniques by viewing it. I want to welcome each and every one of you to our inclusive story time. This story time can benefit and be enjoyed by all children uh, but we make a special effort to provide a setting and appropriate content tailored to children with special needs, especially those on the autistic spectrum. Now, we got a few basic rules to make this a fun and enjoyable experience. One, our eyes are for looking. I might ask you, eyes up here, and so I gotta see those eyeballs. Uh, also, ears are for listening. I might say, gotta listen up, gotta listen carefully. So. Well, need your ears. And use your words. If you need something, we got to know what you want. So use your words so we know what you want, okay? Now, we'll be moving around and doing things, but at times we'll be sitting down and we want our body to be calm. So body calm. We'll be doing our welcome, which this is part of it. But we're going to have a list of things to keep you informed where we're at in our story time. So you can just relax and enjoy it. We'll also be doing music. I hope you like music <laughs> because I'm going to be playing some music and I think you'll have a lot of fun. We'll be doing some stories. You can tell by the little red book our stories are coming up. Then we'll have some fun stories. We'll be doing a little bit of finger plays. Finger plays are fun. And activities. This is where we get up and we'll be able to jump around, have fun, and you'll be able to follow it in our order that we do here. And at the end, stay and play. How fun is that? We have toys in our toy box that we'll pull out and you can play with toys if your mom or dad say it's okay. So at the end, stay and play. Well, let's start with our welcome. You know, if you couldn't speak, you could use sign language to say welcome. It's easy. 
put your hands by your mouth like this. Can you put your hands by your mouth and go like this? And so drop it down in a welcoming gesture and smile. That way they know you're really happy. So hands up to your mouth and down and smile. That means welcome. Well, I've got a little uh, puppet here. Its name is Pinky. Now, you'll know why its name is Pinky when you see it. It's going to say hi to you. If you don't want to see Pinky, just sort of shake your head and I'll stay away. But otherwise, if you want to say hi, you can pet Pinky, but be gentle. Pinky is on strings. <laughs> You want to say hi? You want to sit up? You want to, sit, you want to pet Pinky? You give her a little gentle hug if you like. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you want to see Pinky? Is that okay? <laughs> you want to say hi to Pinky? You, you want to say hi? Do you want to it'll just sniff your shoe if you like? Oh, it's, oh, good job. Good boy. Yeah. Oh, excellent. This dog won't hurt you. Oh, good job. Yeah, good job. You did good. You want to say hi to Pinky? <laughs> oh. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, nice and gentle. Good. <laughs> hello, hello. How you doing? Hi, how you doing? <laughs> Pinky, did you say hi? Yeah. Up you go. Uh, Pinky says hi. Now, I play a musical instrument, and yeah, this is an oboe. Yeah, and it makes a squeaky noise, like like a mouse, like a hungry mouse. It says, "Feed me now." Listen. <laughs> Feed me now. <laughs> yeah, and you put the squeaky thing in the oboe, it's going to sound more like an oboe. I'll play just a little bit of music by Handel. Handel was a good musician. Here we go. I'll play a little bit. Now, it's a little bit loud. Don't get freaked out. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, let's give Handel a hand. <laughs> yeah, he wrote that whoa, a lot of years ago. Now there's a song that I really like. It has motions and we get to do the motions together. I put these photos up here to help you with the words and mom or dad, you can help sing along too to help everybody out. It's good morning, dear earth. Good morning, dear sun. Good morning, dear trees and the flowers, everyone. Good morning, dear bees and the birds in the trees. Good morning to you, -hoo. good morning to me. It's a lot of fun. Now we'll be doing motions, so mom and dad, go along with the motions or help your child with it. I think you'll have a lot of fun with this. Good morning. Give me a big circle like this. Put it above your head. Oh, awesome. Now it's windy as all get out. Hello, I'm a little flower. The bees are out. Oh. <laughs> I can fly. I really can. Morning to you and good morning to me. Oh, that was awesome. Let's try that again, okay? Start with the earth. Here we go. Big breath. <gasps> good morning, dear earth. Good morning, dear sun. Good morning, dear trees and the flowers, everyone. Good morning, dear bees and the birds in the tree. Good morning to you and good morning to me. Oh, it's such a good morning. It really is. Let's try it one more time. Good morning, dear earth. Good morning, dear sun. Good morning, dear trees and the flowers, everyone. Good morning, dear bees and the birds in the tree. 
good morning to you and good morning to me. Oh, it's such a good morning. It is. Good morning to you. Good morning to me. Wow, you did good. Give yourselves a big hand. Oh, that was awesome. Uh, these puppet birds, they love the day. They're singing away. Yeah. Now, we have fidget toys. I know some of you like to squeeze and hold something. It makes it uh, if you, something to fun, uh, squeeze and have fun with. So let's pass out fid fidget toys to each of the parents. So you can just grab one or you just pass them out. Yes. Now we're going to have a story. It's a classic fairy tale. Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Eyes up here, guys. Eyes up here. Got, and I want to hear. Got to listen. So we're going to tell a story. And I'm going to have some of you participate with these little icons. And I'm going to give it to you. Then I'll come over and pick it up and use it in the story. So you can be the number one. You can hold too hot. You can hold cottage. I'll come over and, and, and grab it from you, OK? Let's see. And you can be sleepy, yeah. <laughs> and you can be eating. And I'll hold on the rest of them for, the, for my part. But we'll go through and pull them when we come to the story. Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Now, this is a retelling by me, and the artwork is done by David Mejia. Once upon a time, there were three bears. Papa Bear, <laughs> Mama Bear, and Baby Bear. One morning, the three bears sat down for their breakfast. Oh, this porridge is too hot, <laughs> said Papa Bear in his growly, low voice. Oh my, this porridge is too hot, said Mama Bear. Baby Bear exclaimed, yikes, my porridge is way too hot. Oh, I've got a good idea, said Mama Bear. Let's go for a nice walk in the forest, and when we come back, our porridge will be just right. Now let's get our too hot little sticker. See, here's too hot. <laughs> Whoa. Ooh, that's too hot. Yeah, too hot. After the three bears left, Goldilocks came upon their little cottage and she went right in. Now what's a cottage? Let's grab this here. <gasps> a cottage is a little house. In this case, it's a little house in the forest. So she went right in. On the kitchen table, there were three bowls of porridge. She took a bite from the large bowl, but it was too hot. <laughs> she took a, a bite from the uh, middle bowl, but it was too cold. She took a bite from the small bowl, and it was just right. And she ate it all up. With her tummy full, Goldilocks became <sighs> sleepy. So I think we have a sleepy one here. <laughs> Look at her. She's all sleepy. She went to the bedroom where she found three beds. The first bed was large, but it was too hard. She tried the second bed, but it was too soft. Then she tried and crawled into the smallest bed, and it was just right. Goldilocks fell fast asleep. While Goldilocks was sleeping, here she's sleeping, the three bears came home. Someone's been eating my porridge, uh, said Papa Bear. Oh my, someone's been eating my porridge, said Mama Bear. And Baby Bear said, Oh, someone's been eating my porridge, and it's all gone. <laughs> Do we have number four? Ah, here we go. <laughs> awesome. Been eating the porridge, and it's gone. <laughs> the three bears went into the bedroom. Someone's been sleeping in my bed, <laughs> said Papa Bear. Goodness me, someone's been sleeping in my bed, said Mama Bear. Someone's been sleeping in my bed, exclaimed Baby Bear, and she's right here. 
Goldilocks suddenly woke up, and the three bears were staring and looking right at her. In a small voice, she said, I am so sorry. And she jumped out of the bed, and she ran out the front door. Uh, she's really sorry. Oh, feeling bad. Baby bear ran after her, calling out, don't run away. Come back. Let's be friends. Goldilocks heard baby bear, and she stopped. Turning around, she said, I am very sorry for breaking into your home, and I promise to never do it again. After that, Goldilocks and Baby Bear became the best of friends. Yeah. You know, Goldilocks invited Baby Bear, Mama Bear, and Papa Bear to her home for Sunday dinner. It goes to show that even when mistakes are made, if you're sorry, things can turn out all right. Ah, is that a good story? Let's give a hand, Baby Bear. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Um, we really had a wonderful time. And so if you ever have any other questions, you're always welcome to contact us. I'll put our, um, our contact information back up on the board here.